The Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform will now come to order. I want to thank uh, the witnesses and those in the audience and my uh, colleague, Ranking Member Jordan, for your patience. Uh, the House had in consideration a bill that I was the uh, author of, and so I had to uh, be there to present it. And so it's good to be here with you as we start this hearing. This hearing is going to be the fourth in a series on access to pediatric dental services in Medicaid. The subcommittee has focused on this issue since the death of Diamante Driver in February 2007. And that's uh, Diamante Driver's picture. And his death highlighted the inadequacy of dental services for Medicaid enrolled children in, in Maryland. Without objection, the chair and the ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. On February 25th, 2007, Diamante Driver, a 12-year-old boy from Prince George's County, Maryland, died from a brain infection caused by untreated tooth decay. Diamante's tragic death could have been easily prevented by access to dental care. Dental care he was entitled to and should have received through United Healthcare, Maryland's Medicaid dental provider. Unfortunately, that company failed to meet its obligation to provide beneficiaries with access to dental providers. So onerous were the administrative barriers United Healthcare had created, quote, it took one mother, one lawyer, one online help supervisor, and three management professionals to make a dental appointment for one Medicaid child, unquote. According to testimony we received from Lori Norris, a legal advocate who worked with the driver family. In the two and a half years since DeMonte's preventable death, this subcommittee has been conducting an inquiry into the adequacy, adequacy of efforts on a state level to ensure access to pediatric dental services under Medicaid, as well as the actions for, uh, that the Center for Medicaid and State Operations, CMS, uh, to conduct oversight of state systems. At our first hearing on May 2007, we learned that DeMonte Driver was not the only Maryland youth who wasn't receiving dental care to which he was entitled by Medicaid. In fact, our investigation of United Healthcare found that approximately 11,000 Maryland children in United Healthcare's Medicaid operation had not seen a dentist in at least four years. We found that United Healthcare provided information to Medicaid beneficiaries that was so inaccurate and outdated, it would have been vir virtually impossible to find a dental care provider. We also learned that CMS did virtually nothing to address the problems in poorly performing state systems. Dennis Smith, director of CMS at the time, argued that financial sanctions are the only tool CMS has to enforce compliance, and he was unwilling to hand down financial sanctions because he said the cost was ultimately borne by the patient. Simply put, this is not the case, and in a letter to Mr. Smith, the subcommittee outlined nine actions that CMS could take that would serve to enforce the statutory responsibilities that states have to ensure that Medicaid-eligible children have access to dental services. Our second hearing focused on CMS's response to this letter and actions taken by them in the years since DeMonte Driver's death to address the deficiencies in its oversight responsibilities. While they did take some action, their efforts, unfortunately, fell short of affecting any real change. In fact, the hearing revealed that most of the progress of the state of, of Maryland was made despite CMS, that the agency was not actively involved in the state's efforts and provided almost no guidance. Additionally, CMS continued to neglect the issue of provider reimbursement rates, despite hearing testimony about the importance of them to affecting system-wide reform. Astoundingly, Mr. Smith even acknowledged as such uh, during our first hearing, but stubbornly stubbornly uh, continued to avoid the issue. Mr. Smith resigned from his post not long after our second hearing. After that, things began to change. A GAO report, the first of its kind since 2000, 
revealed that millions of Medicaid enrolled children suffer from tooth decay, almost one-third of the total Medicaid population. Medicaid children are roughly twice as likely as privately insured children to suffer from tooth decay. Moreover, this pattern has persisted for years. Very little has been done to improve access to and utilization of dental services. In a sense, the problem of tooth decay is getting worse because the rate of decay in the teeth of children aged two through five has increased in recent years. Now, our third hearing on the issue demonstrated that improvement is possible. Under new leadership and continued congressional scrutiny, CMS began to turn a corner. The interim director of the Center for Medicaid and State Operations outlined a number of actions that they had taken to engage states actively in reform as well as to improve their own oversight functions. They conducted 17 reviews of state systems with utilization rates below 30 percent and provided each state with its own report and recommendations, worked with states to develop oral health schedules that met federal guidelines, and formed an oral health technical advisory group with state Medicaid directors. We also learned that the state of Maryland, where this whole journey began, continued making considerable progress. The Dental Action Committee that they formed developed seven recommendations to improve access to dental care for Maryland's children. Two ended up in a budget submitted by Martin O'Malley, the governor of Maryland, and another was passed by the state legislature. Today, GAO will share the findings of their most recent report, commissioned at the request of myself and Mr. Cummings, on the adequacy of pediatric dental oversight at the state and federal level. And I'm thankful to GAO for their hard work and dedication in studying this problem. We'll also hear for the first time from the new director of Center and Medicaid State Operations. I'm looking forward to their report on the progress they've made and how they plan to use that momentum to address the gaps that remain as I identified in the GAO report. Additionally, we're going to hear from state Medicaid officials and researchers who have studied and implemented successful initiatives to increase access to and utilization of dental services as well as to imp improve provider participation. I believe and hope that CMS has turned a corner in their oversight of pediatric dental services since the death of DeMonte Driver. But the magnitude of the underlying problem is great. And even today, there are millions of children, just like DeMonte, entitled to dental care, but not receiving it. The urgent job of everyone here today is to move quickly to prevent another one of them from dying from preventable dental disease. And, and finally, I just want to uh, share with my colleagues, you know, people ask me uh, when uh, DeMonte's death was first announced, why are you so interested? It's just it's one, one person out of 300 million. You know, these things happen. I remember growing up in the inner city. And I was the oldest of seven. My parents never owned a home. We lived in 21 different places by the time I was 17, including a couple cars. And one of the things we didn't have was dental care. I mean, I can remember chewing on gumballs and having them just break off and my teeth breaking off into the gumballs. And I can remember having dental problems that didn't get treated for a long, long time. And I'm not, I don't want to get too graphic about it, but for those who have experienced uh, being a child without access to dental care, you know what a nightmare it can be. And so, um, DeMonte Driver, that's me. That's me as a, as a young boy. His life was sacrificed to an uncaring system. We can't have any more DeMonte drivers out there. Look at his face. I mean, you just, he's really asking us what we're going to do about this. Are, are we going to take the stand to make sure that the children of America get the dental services that they're entitled to? That's really the challenge we have. And I will not rest. And I know there are colleagues like Mr. Cummings and, and Mr. Jordan who have very powerful feelings about this as well. But I will not rest until we have uh, caused the uh, death of DeMonte Driver to be a driver of a new day in delivering dental services to the children of this country and particularly those who are served by Medicaid. So I want to thank you um, for your indulgence, uh, Mr. Jordan. And with that, I yield uh, to the ranking member of this committee, Mr. Jordan, uh, for what time he may desire for his opening statement. Thank the chairman and, uh, for his work and for his work on calling this, uh, this hearing as well. And 
and for continuing to highlight the important issue of access to dental care for, uh, for children. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about what has been done to enhance pediatric dental services and improve access since these issues were first looked at by the subcommittee following the tragic death of DeMonte, uh, DeMonte Driver in 2007. Barriers to care, including low reimbursement rates for dentists, lack of understanding of the importance of our oral health, and excessive administrative burdens for patients and providers all contribute to the problem. According to the report that GAO in, uh, released today, state Medicaid programs have taken steps toward improving access, but gaps remain that must be addressed. Likewise, CMS has worked to improve its oversight of pediatric dental issues in Medicaid. But more progress is certainly necessary. In 2008, GAO estimated that one in three children on Medicaid had untreated tooth decay. I hope our witnesses today will tell us what is being done to fill these gaps and treat these children. Unfortunately, the issue of access to care is not unique to pediatric dentistry for Medicaid enrollees, but a problem across the healthcare spectrum. The problems of access to care are prevalent in our existing government-run programs, including Medicaid, Medicare, and SCHIP. Low reimbursement rates set at the state level for Medicaid and, and the national level for Medicare lead to a low participation of providers in these programs. In this respect, the terrible story of Mr. Driver can prove to be a lesson as we move through health care reform and evaluate the different options for ensuring a healthier America. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I thank uh, my colleague uh, from Ohio, and the uh, chair recognizes uh, Mr. Cummings from Maryland, who has um, been working on this issue from the time that it was first known, and I want to thank him for his dedication on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I really do thank you for your interest in this issue, and I thank you as I listened to you just a moment ago. I'm reminded that what you have done is that you've taken uh, some of your experiences in life as a child and turned them around and used them as a passport to help others, and that says a lot. So often people want to bury what happened in their past. Um, however, you take it and you raise it up to remind us that this could happen to anybody. Uh, and so I, I do, and, but not only do you do that, you then lay out a mission to correct it. And so I, I really do appreciate you doing this. Um, you know, Diamante uh, died on February 25, 2007. And I know that Chairman Zoll already talked about it, but I, I, I think about it every day, just about when I think about an untreated tooth and an infection spreading to a child's brain. $80 worth of dental care might have saved his life, but Diamante was poor and he never made it to the dental chair. Mr. Chairman, as you recall, we first held a hearing on this topic in my request back on May 2, 2007, in an effort to identify the critical breakdowns in our Medicaid system's provision of dental care to children. As our dental health professionals here today know, oral health is an often overlooked but vital component of health care. Preventive dental care, especially for our children, is a fundamental need for their healthy development into adulthood. In fact, tooth decay is the most common childhood disease. It is five times as common as asthma and seven times as common as hay fever. This, ha this has the most detrimental impact on low-income communities. 80% of cavities occur in only 25% of children, predominantly low-income children. And low-income children suffer twice as much from tooth decay as do more affluent children. Millions of school hours are lost each year to dental-related illness. Poor children suffer nearly 12 times more restricted activity days than children from more affluent families due to dental-related illness. Our previous hearings on this matter revealed woeful failures of the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services and its state partners to comply, comply with Section 1905R3 of the Social Security Act, which ensures that every child, every Medicaid-eligible child, will have access to medically necessary dental care under the Early Periodic Screening, Diagnostic and Treatment, or EPSTD provision. We found that Medicaid fell glaringly short of meeting this mandate and was given directives to address these disparities. 
I'm eager to hear today about efforts uh, that they've uh, partaken in to, to address the disparities. Since Diamante's death, my home state of Maryland has resolved to do everything possible to prevent such an avoidable tragic loss, and we have made significant gains to improve children's access to dental care. In just two years, Mr. Chairman, 41,000 more children in Maryland received a Medicaid-funded dental service than those who received such a service in 2007. In 2009 alone, Maryland is making an overall $81.5 million investment in Medicaid dental services statewide. Governor Martin O'Malley, to his credit, also convened a dental action committee which developed seven recommendations to better serve our children, including raising reimbursement rates for dental services, initiating a single statewide vendor for dental services, spending $2 million per year to enhance the dental health infrastructure, providing dental screenings for children, creating a new dental hygienist uh, position, improving education for dental students, and crafting a public education campaign on oral health. The governor included the first three items in, in his uh, 2000 budget, and he is in currently working with a dental action committee to implement the others. Similarly, the United Health Group has stepped up to the plate to do its part. It invested $170,000 for a program at the University of Maryland Dental School to improve children's access to dental care in Baltimore City, including more than $30,000 to hire a pediatric dentistry case manager, more than $60,000 to hire a pediatric dentistry fellow, $30,000 to establish a mini pediatric dentistry clinic, and $15,000 to provide continuing education to pediatric and family practice residents. As I close, the company is now working to develop a similar partnership with Howard University that will reach across the Maryland border to Diamante's home county, Prince George's. All of these actions are not commendable. However, they are being implemented solely on a state level. In order for us to see monumental gains, changes must be made nationwide. We have been anticipating a review of CMS's efforts since our last hearing to learn what has been accomplished at the federal level. We were sorely disappointed regarding the lack of demonstrable effort between our first and second hearings, so GAO's report has been eagerly awaited. I'm hopeful that we are turning the page to a new day, and with the leadership of Ms. Cindy Mann, CMS will work to create innovative reforms to address the concerns raised in the GAO report, and these reforms will incorporate the effective and efficient programs that are already working on the state level. Mr. Chairman, a child died because of our failure as adults of our failure as adults to discharge this mandate. For Diamante Driver and for every child and adult like him, we must proceed with a sense of great urgency and with an unfailing determination to see our efforts to completion. It is their turn. It is their turn to grow up. It is their turn to be healthy children. It is their turn to, to deliver and develop the gifts that they've been given to deliver to us. But if they are not healthy, and if their teeth are rotting, and if we're not doing anything about it, shame on us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cummings, for your commitment, your statement, your heart, your passion, and your willingness to take a stand. We're now going to um, go to the witnesses. There are no additional opening statements. The subcommittee will receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. I'd like to start by introducing our first panel. Ms. Catherine Irritani, is that right? Ms. Catherine Irritani is Acting Director for Healthcare Issues at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. In her 27-year career with GAO, she has helped plan and execute a wide variety of program and evaluation assignments. In recent years, she has seen multi overseen multiple evaluative studies on Medicare financing and access issues, including children's access to preventive and dental services. Ms. Iratani currently works in JO's Seattle field office and has a business administration degree from the University of Washington. Next, Ms. Cynthia Mann. Ms. Mann was appointed director of the Center for Medicaid and State Operations, CMSO, in June 2009, 
where she is responsible for the development and implementation of national policies governing Medicaid, the State Children's Health Insurance Program, Survey and Certification, Medicaid Integrity Program, and the Clinical Laboratories Improvement Amendments. Uh, CMSO, the Center for Medicaid and State Operations, also serves as the focal point for all CMS interactions with states and local governments. Prior to her return to CMS in 2009, uh, Ms. Mann served as a research professor at Georgetown University Health Policy Institute and the executive director of the Center for Children and Families at the Institute. Her work at Georgetown focused on health coverage, financing, and access issues affecting low-income populations. Previously, she served as director of the Family and Children's Health Programs at CMSO from 1999 to 2001, where she played a key role in implementing Medicaid and the uh, SCHIP program. Before joining the government in 1999, Ms. Mann led the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities federal and state health policy work. She also has extensive state-level experience, having worked on health care, welfare, and public finance issues in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New York. Thank you both for appearing before the subcommittee today. It's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that each witness answered in the affirmative. I would ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of your testimony. I ask that you keep this summary under five minutes in duration. Your complete written statements are going to be in the record, and we'll that's what we're here to do, to have you amplify on that in your time that you'll be presenting. So I would like uh, you, Ms. Iratani, to be our first witness. Uh, you may begin. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here to discuss children's access to Medicaid dental services, a longstanding concern. As you noted in your opening re remarks, an estimated one of every three children in Medicaid has untreated tooth decay. One in nine have it in three or more teeth. This is about twice the rate experienced by privately insured children and translates to millions of Medicaid children in need of dental care. In too many cases, this need is urgent. My statement is based on GAO's report that you are releasing today. This report summarizes, at a national level, efforts of states and CMS to improve Medicaid dental services for children. In summary, we found that state Medicaid programs and CMS have taken a number of actions to monitor and improve children's access to dental services. But problems with access persist and gaps in CMS oversight remain. First, let me share highlights of states' actions from our web-based survey of state Medicaid programs. All states reported monitoring children's access to dental services, and nearly all states had implemented one or more initiatives to improve access through actions to reach out to families, such as establishing hotlines to help them find a dentist, and initiatives such as raising reimbursement rates to encourage more dentists to serve Medicaid children. Nonetheless, states reported multiple barriers to improving access. These barriers are well known and longstanding, for example, for families finding a dentist to treat their children. For providers, concerns remain about families missing their appointments, low reimbursement rates, and administrative burdens. These barriers persist despite states' actions to address them. Of significance, most states indicated their initiatives to improve access had not met their expectations, and two-thirds of the 21 states that reported contracting with managed care organizations to provide dental services said those organizations were not meeting the state's access standards. The bottom line, 
children's access to Medicaid dental services has been improving, but remains low. States report that only about 35% of Medicaid children nationally received any dental service in 2007, as compared to HHS's goal of 66% of low-income children receiving a preventive dental service by 2010. Now let's turn to actions of CMS. CMS has improved its oversight of state's programs in several ways, but more can be done. Two observations. First, CMS has focused dental reviews of 17 states with low dental access rates, identified significant problems, including concerns in eight states that managed care organizations had inadequate numbers of dentists in their networks. CMS did not, though, require corrective action plans of states or have plans to review other states with low dental access rates. Second, CMS has improved its guidance to and communications with states. For example, CMS posted descriptions of four states' promising practices for improving access on its website. But nearly every state, 49 in all, reported to us that they need more from CMS. States reported, for example, that they need specific guidance in areas such as establishing appropriate dental payment rates and improving billing policies. Notably, when we asked states how CMS could help them, most states answered that CMS should provide more information on what was working in other states. 26 states reported to us that they believed their state had one or more best practice for delivering dental services that could be shared with others. In conclusion, CMS and states have taken noteworthy steps to improve children's access to Medicaid dental services. Concerted and continued efforts, and in these challenging fiscal times, innovative solutions will be needed to address the multiple and long-standing barriers to improving children's oral health. For its part, CMS can help through ongoing oversight and assessment, guidance, and support of states' efforts, building upon the steps the agency has recently undertaken. We've made several recommendations to CMS towards this end and have ongoing work for the Congress further examining these issues. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I thank the gentlelady. The chair recognizes Ms. Mann. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee. Um, I, too, appreciate the opportunity to be with you today to talk about how children are faring receiving needed dental services under the Medicaid program. And I want to begin by commending you, Mr. Chairman, for your sustained interest in this area. I have been the director for the Centers for Medicaid and State Operation for a little less than four months, um, and I've not been a witness to the prior hearings. However, in my position um, at Georgetown University, I closely followed the proceedings. And now that I'm director of CMSO and have taken stock of what we've done in the past uh, period of time, um, it is clear to me that the activity that has happened was triggered in large part by the activity of this committee and by your interest in this area, and that you have been able to plant the seeds for a renewed commitment on this very important matter. While I'm new to CMS, I'm not new to this issue. As you noted um, in your introduction of me, I've worked on children's access issues for many years. Um, and I would note that in my 18 months at CMS in 1999 and 2001, um, I helped author the letter that was issued in January 2001, which you referred to in your first hearing, which called for every state to conduct a dental access review. Since that time, many states have made progress narrowing dental access gap for children, but as the GAO correctly points out, significant gaps remain. We know from the research that there's an inextricable link between oral health and overall health, and that every child needs dental care, preventive care, and treatment when appropriate. Sadly, our country's record in assuring our kids have the dental care they need, both in private coverage as well as in public coverage, is not good, and the record is particularly poor for low-income children. I can assure you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, that Sub Secretary Sebelius and I share a firm belief that we have a responsibility to do much more to assure that every child enrolled in Medicaid receives the dental care they need. The data show that about 36 percent of all Medicaid-eligible children used to dental services over a year's period of time, 
With that data, there can be little doubt that improvements are necessary. States administer the program, they enroll the providers, they set the provider rates, but CMS plays a critical role and we are intent on using all of the tools available to us to ensure that every child covered by Medicaid is as healthy as he or she can be. My written testimony uh, lists a number of actions that CMS has taken over the past uh, period of time since the last hearing. I'm just going to re review it, a few of those activities. In policymaking activity, we are now actively involved in uh, providing guidance in the area of uh, children's health insurance coverage and the new CHIPR provisions uh, that expanded dental benefits for children in a number of different ways. In fact, today we released our guidance to states on the new CHIP dental health benefit and the supplemental insurance option that's now available to states to provide dental coverage to children who have other sources of care. Um, CHIPR also included several other provisions that we're working on. One was a provision that required the secretary to publish the names of the dentists serving children in the Medicaid program in every state around the country, Medicaid and the CHIP program. We launched that website on August 4th and um, have those dental providers listed at this point. That website, I will say, um, uh, is, a, is a work in progress. We think that there's a, a number of improvements that we want to continue to make. We have had a, number of a lot of activity on that website, about 43,000 hits to the page. Um, but there are improvements that can be done, and we think we can ultimately use that website not only to share information to families like DeMonte Driver's family about where to get dental care, but also for us to use as a monitoring tool to be able to see what the numbers of dentists uh, are in each Medicaid program, how many are taking new patients, and what that access looks like over time. Uh, we also are intent on changing our data reporting system. Uh, we want to change the so-called CMS 416, which is our EPSDT reporting form, to include information about other providers that are providing oral health care, um, as well as um, to improve, uh, to make other improvements to the 416, and we're planning to do that by the spring of this year. There are a number of uh, requirements to changes in the 416 that were part of CHIPRA, so we want to consolidate those changes and put those out in the spring. Um, we're also partnering right now with the Agency for Health uh, health quality and research um, to come up with dental, uh, dental health quality standards as part of the overall initiative to come up with children's health standards. We believe that those health standards, those dental quality standards themselves, which will be reported by states, hopefully, um, it's a voluntary reporting by states, will again give us another window to uh, assure that children are getting the care that they need and, and get states to pay continued attention to the need to pay to oral health services. Um, we're also helped, as you noted uh, in your introductory remarks, Chairman Kucinich, uh, by a new oral health ad technical advisory group that's going to help us move forward in our policy making. But a second area of work besides uh, policy. Gentlelady's time has expired, but I'll let, you, I'll let you make uh, concluting Okay. Statement. Um, uh, let me conclude by saying our two other areas that we're focusing on besides policy making is identifying best practices, sharing those widely with states, meeting with states on best practices, and then the issue of oversight. On those 16 state reviews on August 27th, I issued a letter to all of those states saying that we wanted to know the results of those recommendations in those reviews. Our regional offices are now working with each of those states and we will look at those reviews and also uh, assess whether additional reviews are needed. Thank you. I wanted to um, just close by saying that um, uh, we are committed to continuing to make this a focus of our work as we go forward and always welcome your insights and your suggestions in terms of moving forward. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, we're going to go to questions of the witnesses. The uh, chair and the ranking member will have uh, 10 minutes for questions and followed by five minutes from other members' questions. Uh, we'll see how we go in, in the rounds, you know, whether we go one round or two round. So uh, I'll begin by uh, asking Ms. Iratani, does GAO have an estimate of the number of Medicaid-eligible children who did not receive a single dental service? Yes, we do. How many? How many? That would be 12.6 million on the okay. basis of nationally Thank representative you. surveys. What percent of, cho of children does that work out to be? That's 66 percent of Medicaid children. So the reality is that you say 66 percent of the eligible children do not receive 
dental services. Meanwhile, the Depart Department of Health and Human Services has established a national goal of achieving 66 percent of eligible, eligible children who do receive dental services by next year. So we've got 66 percent not receiving and the goal is 66 percent who will receive the a preventive dental services, dental service. preventive dental services. Uh, that is, to achieve the national goal, we're essentially going to have to turn the current statistics on their head. Now, Ms. Mann, uh, uh, you've inherited an agency that, for the better part of a decade, has uh, been held back from making progress towards uh, this goal. For instance, when we asked the official who preceded you what was, it was going to take to, take and, uh, to, to increase access to dental services, he didn't believe there was much he could do. He didn't believe that he could require corrective actions of the states. What do you believe? I think there's a great deal that we can do, Chairman. Um, I believe it's a multi-pronged problem, and we have an obligation to have a multi-pronged solution. I think it's both. Well, excuse me. That's those are words. I. I think we have to do some guidance to states. If they're looking for guidance on how to set dental uh, rates, we'll provide that guidance on how to set dental rates. I believe we need to do oversight. As I, as I mentioned, we are following up with each of the 16 states that we did the initial reviews. There was, uh, had not been follow-up till I got back to the, um, till I took on uh, at CMSO. And um, we will assess whether additional state reviews are necessary. What I want to do is focus on these 16 states, see where we are, see what progress has been made. I do think that, that CMS can do corrective action plans. Uh, we plan on doing it in a number of different areas where it's necessary. I'd like to work with states and share best practices. These are complicated areas. These they are, are troubling. We're, we're going we're to get into the corrective action a little, in a little bit. I, I want to go back to Ms. Iratani, if you excuse me, uh, and thank you. We're you know, trying to create a dialogue here. Uh, Ms. Iratani, in your testimony, you mentioned that more than half of the 21 states that provide dental services through managed care organizations have reported that MCOs in their state do not meet any or only meet some of the state's dental access standards. Approximately how many children are going without dental services in those states? That's a difficult question to answer because unfortunately the data by delivery system is not reliable. Um, so the 416 that captures the data on access um, by delivery system we have found um, does not break out um, managed care versus fee-for-service for, for access, and, and those states do not have um, managed care throughout Okay, if, we, if we're looking at state. achieving a goal then, but we, we need to really have some uh, quantitative assessment of where we start. Do you have any guess at all? Do you have a, a best guess of what that number would be? How many children are going without dental services in states? In states that have managed care? There are 21 states that reported that they had managed care. But in some of those states, the managed care penetration rate, that is the number of children that were receiving dental services through managed care was very low. Okay. So I, we're, we're we gonna, can't uh, answer that question. We're gonna work with you to help get the breakdown so we know where the targets are in terms of the goals that we have to reach. We have to know where we're starting. And, and it's, since it is on a state by state basis, so we're gonna need your help on that. Now, this, uh, this, Ms. Mann, this subcommittee found that uh, United Healthcare's inadequate dental provider network was a contributing factor to the preventable death of DeMonte Driver. As you know, CMS recently conducted a significant review of dental services in 17 states, and you identified uh, eight states where Medicare managed care organization provider networks were not assured of being adequate to provide access to dental services. Ms. Mann, do you believe that inadequate dental provider networks in Medicaid managed care organizations are a significant barrier for children to receive dental care? 
Uh, Chairman, I think there's an access problem inside managed care and outside managed care. Um, and well, let's talk about inside managed care. What do you believe? I think it depends on each state, and in some states, their managed care organizations are not uh, providing a sufficient network. Okay, let's. You, you, so, what are you saying? It depends on each state. That's not. That's. I need something more specific here. You're giving me answers that are interesting, but they're very general. And the way that this committee works is we learn by getting specific answers. Can you be specific? Each state is different, Chairman, so I can't tell you that there's, it's not that inherently managed care is a problem. It is that every state should has, has an obligation to make sure that network is sufficient. In those eight states, we're following up specifically to look at what steps those states have taken. Okay, now each state is different. I'm, thank you. Now I'm focusing on Medicaid managed care organizations because they behave like a traditional HMO in the Medicaid context, retaining the risk in exchange for capitation fees. Under Medicaid, they make money when their enrollees don't get medical and dental care. This subcommittee held a hearing last month on the health insurance industry, and the industry spending on members' uh, health care is known as medical losses. And insurance company executives try hard to keep those losses to a minimum. Obviously, one of the ways a for-profit Medicaid managed care organization can please Wall Street and can keep their medical losses to a minimum is by making it difficult for people who are, uh, who are covered to find a dentist who will accept Medicaid. In your opinion, have you seen any evidence that dental utilization rates differ according to whether a state relies upon for-profit Medicaid managed care organizations to provide coverage? The study that I've seen is the study that actually you asked for, um, Chairman, in the CRS report, and it certainly showed um, dental access problems. I have not seen a more broad, a broad across the board study of it. Um, I think that um, uh, the evidence is, is that uh, in risk-based contracts, there can be a greater propensity uh, for denial of care, and therefore there's a greater obligation if the state chooses to set up its system that way to oversee and make sure that that care is sufficient. Medicaid obligation. Well, okay. Now, I'd, 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 we're making some progress here. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, that you and your staff consider correspondence received by my staff from Dr. Burton Adelstein in which he finds evidence for a correlation between Medicare managed care organizations and lower dental utilization, utilization rates. Did you collect uh, data from the states which would allow you to determine if this is a factor, if there is a correlation between Medicaid? Uh, you asked about for-profit managed care organizations. I have not looked at data looking at for-profit managed care organizations. We can look at that more closely, Chairman. I'd be glad to look at that more good. closely. Good. Thank you. I, w I will say that we have a real problem in the fee-for-service area as well. And so I think that well, that, that's not what this hearing is about, though, is it? I thought the hearing is about uh, ma uh, Medicaid access for children. Okay. Um, Ms. Mann, do you believe that inadequate dental provider uh, networks, uh, where they're connected to this for-profit motive, are, uh, are one of the reasons why so many of these children are not getting health care? It's because of the way the system is structured. I think that Medicaid managed care organizations can make it worse or can make it better depending upon how, what the financing looks like, what the incentives are, and what the oversight is. I want to ask you about one of the GAO's findings that troubles me. In testimony before this subcommittee in September 2008, uh, interim Director Herb Kuhn testified, CMS will require corrective actions for those states not in compliance with federal regulations. However, you told GAO that you will only follow up with states, but had no plans to require action from them. As you wrote in a cover letter, quote, these were programmatic reviews, and as such, formal, quote, corrective action plans, unquote, were not required. I'm wondering if CMS has backed down from its earlier commitment to this subcommittee to require corrective actions from the states. 
As I stated a moment ago, we believe that corrective action plans are, are part of our, um, our, our tool kit in terms of moving forward on the Medicaid program. These reviews were done, as you noted, before I came, and they were set up as technical assistance reviews. So you plan to require corrective can, action plans? Can, if I could finish? Well, um, I'm just can you answer that question, though. If there, when we complete these reviews back from the regional offices, if we still see problems, then we will move forward in a, in a separate action for corrective action plans, yes. So you're not adverse to corrective action plans? Absolutely not. And you'll be letting this community know about time frames for a component of that requirement? Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Chair recognizes Mr. Jordan. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Let me, uh, let me pick up where the Chairman was. Um, the Chairman's, the first, first question, or first point he made was only a third of children, this I guess, I, I think, assuming you got his information the same place I did, GAO study last year, uh, only one in three children are getting uh, treatment. Uh, for tooth decay and other dental problems. So I, I just want to, I guess, cut to the chase. I, have you seen an improvement in the past year? Is it better now? What's the status? And I understand that just last year's study, but here we are late in 2009. What kind of improvement have we seen um, in helping, uh, helping these kids? And I'll go to Ms. Mann first. The data from the last two years shows a slight improvement from 33% um, to 36% of kids having uh, a, per, a dental visit in the past year. So we're nationwide, we're moving, albeit very slowly, in the right direction. I would say most people would say that's real slowly in the right direction. Okay, and, and Ms. Ritani, do you want to comment? Uh, yes, and, and we've seen the same data. Okay. Uh, let me let me just bring up something uh, the um, uh, to Ms. Iritani, and you talked about um, one of the things that states have reported is this rather heavy administrative burden. In fact, I remember my days at the working at the state house, and you talk to local officials. It's it's always you know dealing with the federal government, dealing over for county governments, dealing with the state government and the federal government. So. Um, is, a, is it true? Do you feel like there's a big burden you've placed on, on uh, that's been placed on um, by the federal government on states? And, um, you know, what ways can, can states better navigate this and better deal with this, with this situation? And we'll let both of you go at it. We asked states um, about the barriers in their states to providers serving more children. Most states actually reported um, broken appointments, patients missing appointments as a major moderate barrier. Um, administrative requirements was reported as a major barrier to providers serving more children by about 28 states. Um, so not not. Would as you be much supportive? Of an issue. And one of the things I worked on my days in the state house was because with the whole welfare reform thing. Would you be supportive of some kind of, of some kind of penalty for? Um, I'm just curious uh, for parents who uh, the appointment's been made. It's you know you've, there's 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 it's in place and they don't. Would you be in favor of some kind of um, some kind of penalty for for families who don't who don't bring their child to the uh, for that appointment? We ask states about model practices, and I think there are states that are actually dealing with the broken appointment issue without a penalty situation. Um, Virginia, for example, um, re reported on a broken appointment initiative whereby they tracked broken appointments and tried to help patients um, get to their appointments. Okay. Go ahead. And I interrupted you. Go ahead. What other, what other uh, actions are being taken to help? States deal with the um, the administrative burden. Um, our report didn't look at those issues. Ms. Mann. Um, Representative, uh, just to be clear, the federal government <coughs> does not, in this instance, uh, require any uh, paperwork that the states use to enroll their providers. So there have been, as, as uh, GAO has reported, 28 states identify, and providers often have identified that paperwork as a problem. It's a, if so, it's a state-initiated um, problem, and it's one of the things that I think is 
routinely on states' list to try mm -hmm. and address. And I think some of the states here to testify today will talk about what they've done to reduce that. It's an internal paperwork. issue. It's a state, it's a state okay. issue. It's okay. to the extent that it's causing barriers, we regard it as a CMS issue, an oversight issue, uh, but it's not requirements that we put on states. Okay, okay. Let me ask you, one of the things I remember, and this is oh, probably 15, 20 years ago, um, I guess 15, 18 years ago, and it may better be better for the second panel, but um, in, in Ohio, this this was way back in when I was this when I was assistant wrestling coach at Ohio State University. One of the, one of the programs they had in place was the dental school would um, we knew about it because I was you know employed at Ohio State, but you know we had four children, so we were looking to get the cheapest care possible for our kids. We took them to the to the to the uh, to the uh, uh, dental college dental school. And uh, we were very pleased, and it was very, you know, very inexpensive. I don't even know what it cost, but I just know when you're, you know, young couple and you got four kids, or maybe at the time we only had three, um, you're looking to save dollars wherever you can. It seemed to work. It seems to me that's that's a concept where, you know, here's a here's a state institution receiving all kinds of taxpayer support already, um, many times in large metropolitan areas. That's that's something that we should be encouraging, and again, I was looking ahead in my, in my briefing book here, I think we're gonna hear from one of our witnesses about this issue, but, or about this type of program. That makes all the sense in the world to me. Um, maybe a little more difficult in, in rural areas where there may not be a dental school as close, but you gotta believe that's a way to um, help meet this need and not cost the taxpayers more money, which is obviously something that I know I'm concerned about, and I assume, the, 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 and I think the rest of the, the committee as well. So, uh, t if you could talk about that that concept and what's what's going on already, and how I we can encourage more. There of that. are a number of dental schools that are providing direct services. Also, there's some new programs being involved, and we are trying to think partnering with them in order to provide some payment for training. So, and also some loan repayment programs so that the dental uh, students that get trained go out into low income communities. Um, there's also uh, county health departments that are mm -hmm. providing dental health services and a lot of uh, federally qualified health centers. So I think looking at all of those avenues to build our, our workforce in terms of oral health providers is right. I was just talking to a state legislator yesterday from Kansas. They don't have a dental school in Kansas. Mm -hmm. So that's why each, you know, each state you need to think about the different, the landscape and what can work. But I think the dental schools have been, uh, can be very critical. Do, do either of you know how many states are, are implementing such a, uh, an approach right now? Uh, with one of their, with one or their, of their dental schools, or maybe their their single dental school. I don't know, but we can find that out and seems, get that information seems, to you. It, it's like, look, if that's working, in, you know, many states have dental schools. Sure. Uh, it's certainly something we should be doing. And again, not reinventing the wheel. We're always talking about the reimbursement rate and what provide. This is dental students. They need they need patients to to learn their craft on. So it makes sense to me. Ms. Irritani, did you want to comment? Uh, do you have any idea? I think that there are many states that have innovative practices such as that, and we recommended to CMS that they um, you don't develop know the number, more ways though. to share. Okay, okay. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back to balance my time. I thank the gentleman. Chair recognizes Mr. Cummings. You may proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you both for your testimony, and I, I must admit that, um, Ms. Mann, I've been feeling uh, a feeling of deja vu. Uh, in that uh, under the previous administration, CMS, so often this committee felt like we were getting the rope-a-dope. And um, I want to be specific because I'm talking about the lives of children. You said that there were things that you were willing to do. And, Mr. Chairman, I, I hope you'll understand what I'm about to say. I, I want to make sure that Ms. Mann is held accountable and I want specific commitments for these children. We've been through a process, Mr. Chairman, as you will recall, where we were told things and nothing happened. Now either we're going to get some specifics as to what is going to happen and address these children's needs as the urgency of now, to borrow President Obama's words, because it is the urgency of now when only one-third of our children are getting what they need 
so that they can grow up and be able to sit at a table like that, to be able to go to school without pain, to be able to live a healthy life, or we need to do something different. We need to be specific. Ms. Iritani, you said here that CMS agreed to three of the four recommendations, is that right? And partly the fourth, is that correct? That's correct. And which ones did they partly agree to? They agreed in part with our recommendation to conduct reviews in all states with low dental access rates. They indicated that they would consider conducting additional reviews in the context of other programmatic reviews. All right, Ms. Mann, you said that there were things that you all were going to do. Can you go down each one of the things that you said you're going to do or are doing and give us timetables now? Because the way we like to operate is we like to bring you back on the date within a week or two after you say it's going to be done so that we can make sure it's done. See, we, we have a limited amount of time to be in these jobs. We may not win the next election. And so we have to be, we want to make sure that we are effective and efficient while we are here. Other than that, we might as well go and play golf. So the question becomes, what are you willing to do? When are you going to do it? And Mr. Chairman, you set the schedule, but I'd like for that so that we can come back and check with Ms. Mann as to what, if she makes a commitment, that we uh, be able to have her come before us and let us know that the commitment has been, been completed. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, of course. Uh, this is our fourth hearing, uh, and you've been instrumental in creating every one of these hearings. And as I indicated in, uh, in my opening remarks, uh, we're going to stay on this. So we're going to get to know each other real well. And we're going to have a chance to be able to compare notes and uh, establish metrics, timetables, completion of items. Because look where we are. 66% aren't getting the dental services to which they are entitled. And the goal is for 66% of children to get it. Yes. So with your persistence and uh, working with Mr. Jordan and our subcommittee, I think, I think we've, we've got a long way to go. But uh, Ms. Mann is now on that road with us. So we'll look forward to working with you. Now, Mr. I'll yield back to Mr. Cummings. I just want to go through the things that you, the, the action that you are going to take and when you expect to have it done. That's all. I mean, you can be briefly, you've, you've talked it a little bit already, but I just want to know exactly what you're going to do to correct this situation to get to that goal. Do you agree with the goal, first of all? Absolutely. Okay. Now, can just I, tell, tell I, us what you plan to do. And, and Ms. Ms. Mann, don't take this personally. I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm serious. I'm speaking up for kids. I'm speaking up, you know, the chairman talked about himself. I was the same little kid that got all kinds of dental treatment later in my life. I've got kids right now in Baltimore who are going to the University of Maryland Dental School because of Diamante Driver in part. And they're discovering that the infection has gone to their eyes. See, apparently, I don't know that much about dentistry. Apparently, it goes to your eye before it goes to your brain. And I'm talking up for those little kids because I want them to grow up. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of pushing hard on this, because I don't want us to be making these same arguments a year from now, or two years from now, and then uh, some kid who only has, by the way, a limited amount of time to be a child, I don't want to be in a situation where that child is either harmed because we did not do what we could have done. I want every child... I think it was Maslow that says we must be what we can be. And I want every child to be what he or she can be. So you can, you can go ahead and tell us when you're going to do, when you're going to do, what you're going to do. And then I'm sure the chairman will uh, deal with scheduling hearings appropriately so that we can measure our progress. There are a number of actions already underway. As I, as I noted on August 22nd, 27th, I wrote to each of the states in the 16, that had 16, uh, the 16 states that had reviews. The regional offices are currently engaged with those states. I can commit to you that in 30 days we can tell you a response from those, uh, from those follow-up reviews from the regional offices and let you know where we stand on each of those reviews. 
We have a listening session on EPSDT and where we should go on EPSDT, which is, as you know, the, the children's benefit package in Medicaid, scheduled for October 16th. That's the first. We plan to have a few uh, in that series to help guide us on what are the most important actions we can take going forward. I'm happy to commit to you that a week after that October 16th listening session to let you know exactly what the recommendations were going forward. Uh, we plan to do dental reviews in each of the states that are, that are at the top of the list to identify, as the GAO has recommended, what those best practices are. And I can commit to you to provide you that information in the next, um, I have to figure out exactly when we can do those reviews, but I can follow up and give you an exact date as to when we can do those and when we can provide Can you give me an outside date? I mean, Sure, I, I would say by December. Um, okay. uh, we have committed to do the change in the 416 report by the spring um, of this year. We have a number of changes that we've already developed. Um, and then there's new legislation in Chipper that we want to incorporate in those changes, and we want to do some consultation with experts. So we are having that consultation that's part of the listening session that's scheduled for October 16th. We're doing that consultation this fall. We're going to be doing those changes this spring in, in the 416, which is to improve some of the data collection issues so that we can give you the numbers that you're looking for, so that we can have a better idea and a more accurate idea, whether it's in managed care or fee-for-service, how many kids are or aren't getting those, the, the services that they need. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, uh, Ms. Mann, you can tell by uh, Mr. Cummings' remarks uh, that uh, this committee uh, needs your cooperation and that um, we, are, we are not going to stand by and watch any more little kids dying. I just, you know, and, and don't take this personally, but it's your job now. It's your responsibility. And so whoever was sitting in that chair is going to hear the same thing from members of this committee about your obligation to these children. These aren't statistics to us. These are, this was a, 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 a child that was full of promise like every child. And, and the system let this happen to this child. And I see from your background that you have concerns about people who are in these lower economic situations. That's where I come from. And I, and I, I identify with DeMonte. So that's why I will not give you or any witness who comes from the administration any wiggle room on this question. You won't have it. Just know that. I'm, you know, with all due respect, because you know what? A child died. Now, I want to, uh, one of the significant reforms that could, in theory, increase the number of children who receive some preventive dental services is allowing pediatricians to uh, apply uh, fluoride varnishes. However, this subcommittee has heard that the administrative barriers to reimbursement for providing those services are discouraging doctors from doing it. My staff has received this correspondence from the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics on this topic, and I ask unanimous consent to uh, put this in the record. Uh, are you, uh, can you do anything about streamlining reimbursement for this procedure? We do. We, uh, thank you. Um, the Medicaid program does, will, does already in many states reimburse pediatricians for providing sealants. And if there's any question that states have about their ability to claim Medicaid reimbursement for that procedure, uh, we can certainly clarify Great. that immediately. If you'd study that letter, it'd be very helpful. Maybe you could respond to it and send us a copy. I'd be in glad a letter to, to the that. subcommittee, uh, Dr. James Crawl, who's testified before us on two occasions, <laughs> recommends, quote, Uniform program oversight and performance assessment regardless of state of residence. I ask unanimous consent to insert the entire text of uh, Dr. Kral's correspondence uh, into the record. Ms. Mann, what can CMS do to fix the patchwork of oversight at the state level and to create a uniform system of oversight and assessment? I think we can do a uniform system of assessment, um, Chairman. I think that the responses aren't uniform because the problems aren't uniform, um, and that's it's it's 
if I could wave the wand and get that 66 percent and make it all happen by doing reviews tomorrow, I would do that. We don't have providers in many states and in many parts of the country that are willing to take Medicaid be beneficiaries. Um, we, have a, we have a participation rate, a, a utilization rate in private health insurance of about 59 percent right now. We've got a multitude of problems in terms of getting oral health care to children, um, both in and outside of the public systems. It is not an overnight problem. We will commit, and we are committed, to doing everything we can to make the Medicaid program work for every child and to make sure that that dental care is there. Um, but it is a multi-pronged problem, and I don't say that to try and, to try and get around our responsibilities. I say that to, to say that we're rolling up our sleeves and it is not a simple solution. If I could do the oversight of 50 states tomorrow and say that would solve it, I would do the oversight 50 states tomorrow. It won't solve it, but it'll get us farther along and we're willing to do that, of course, and to be as aggressive as we can. Yeah, I, I, think the, I think the, uh, the, by, the watchwords would be corrective action here, wherever there is action to be taken. That. Uh, you don't stand by and figure they'll solve their own problems. I, I agree. I uh, agree. But when we have states come to us and say they don't have an, a dental provider within, in, right. you know, five counties of their state, corrective action but, plans won't get the but, child but, the dental But DeMonte care. Driver died. Uh, he had a provider all right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And that would yeah. have been a very different story. That's yeah. exactly right. So we understand that there are certain circumstances where you have to become involved in encouraging states with respect to their to provider networks. But there's areas where they have providers. And, and we're wondering about corrective action in those areas. Now, Dr. Kral's letter also recommends uniform eligibility and benefits regardless of state of residency. Could you tell us what challenges CMMS faces to creating such a system? In the Medicaid program, actually, there is uniform benefit eligibility for children. Um, that is the EPSDT program. Um, and it is the guarantee that every child get that uniform eligibility, which is simply stated, all the medical care that they need that's deemed necessary. So we have a lot of variations for adults in Medicaid, but not for children. The question is, do we get it enforced, and do we have uh, providers taking the children, and do families know about the availability? And that's why we're setting up this listening session and doing this EPSDT work group. We have a problem beyond oral health. We have a larger problem making sure that EPSDT benefit is observed for every child in the Medicaid program. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of basics I was curious about. What's the, what's the average time a child is, is enrolled in Medicaid? Generally, in any given uh, year, about nine months. So they're in nine months out. I mean, do, is it back and forth a lot? Or t tell me the typical. There's scenario. a fair amount of back and forth. Um, if you look over at their the lifetime, what's the average? I mean, li lifetime is a child from zero to eighteen. Or what's their lifetime? I don't know. Over the lifetime, if you look at a cohort of uninsured children, about a third of them have actually been on Medicaid in the last year or so. Um, I mean, so it's, there's it's, a lot of churning in and out, and one of, the, one of the important advances I think that we can do to help children get access to care is to keep that coverage continuous. But, but my point is, so some of these kids who aren't getting coverage, I mean, does your numbers account for this, this one-third we've, we've determined that are getting uh, the, the dental care? Is, is it because could they be, in fact, moving out of Medicaid and getting care from a private, you know, private source? They could be moving out of care and getting care from private sources. They could be moving out of coverage in Medicaid and simply being uninsured but not have a card to then go to the dentist. And for Medicaid patients, it's probably more the latter, but it could be either. What's the percentage of eligible uh, Medicaid uh, children, uh, percentage who are eligible uh, who aren't enrolled? They are, you, you know, they are the number. I mean, About, give me those numbers. Um, Seven out of ten of all uninsured children are eligible for either Medicaid or CHIP, but not enrolled. Some have been enrolled in the past, um, but they've been uh, churned through the program. But at any given time, about seven out of ten of eligible children, of uninsured children, could be enrolled through either Medicaid or CHIP. They're eligible. Okay. So th that's why enrollment and continuous enrollment is a very important piece of the, of the quality puzzle. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I thank the gentleman. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Cummings. Yeah, Ms. Mann, the uh, Government Accountability Office reported in September 2008 uh, that the extent of dental disease in children had not decreased between 1994 and 2005, and that millions of kids were estimated to have untreated tooth decay. Information from that report showed that about one in three children ages 2 through 18 in Medicaid had untreated tooth decay, and one in nine had untreated decay in three or more teeth. Compared to children with private insurance, and you know, you know the stats. How much funding was lacking, and what was the cause of uh, unavailability? Do you know? In other words, um, what is CMS doing about the urgency of the need for the treatment of, the, of these children, some of whom may be adults now? And, and, and how are we addressing that? How do you plan I'm to I'm sorry, the that? treatment of adults? Yes. In the Medicaid program under federal law, coverage of dental services for adults is optional with the states. Mm -hmm. And as you look through what's going on in the states now and during a recession, it's one of the first set of benefits that, that states will cut out if they're looking to reduce their Medicaid budgets. Mm -hmm. um, so it is not a requirement, nor is the standard, even once they cover an adult, in Medicaid nearly as robust as the standard is for children. Ms. Eritani, you were talking about barriers and what the state folks said were the barriers. And you said that one of the things that was talked about the most was uh, failure to make appointments. Is that right? That's correct. Um, did you all have any recommendations as to how to deal with that? Our recommendations aimed at CMS were to conduct more reviews of the states with low access rates. They, CMS's reviews um, looked at a number of different um, access-related problems, including inadequate provider networks. Mm -hmm. And we also advised CMS that they should take action to ensure that any state found with an inadequate provider network took corrective action. Miss Miss Mann, did you ha you know I was as when she when Miss Yertani was talking about this earlier, I was thinking about how important it is that parents understand the relationship between teeth and the rest of the body. I think a parent, any parent, wants their kid to be healthy, but I don't think a, a lot of parents have a clue uh, of the relationship between the teeth and the body, and I'm just wondering. Did you have any thoughts on that with regard to making sure that we get that information out there? We, uh, well, I was the author of an amendment to SCHIP where we were able to do some things in that regard, but I'm just wondering, uh, is that on your list? Because, you know, that's one of the things that um, it, would, it might cost some money getting the information out, but the benefits would be phenomenal compared to the money that we put out. Because then you have all these agents called parents who, you know, it's just like I think if a parent thought that their kid uh, had a, a fever, they would do everything in their power to address that. When certainly uh, tooth decay could lead to something far worse than a fever. And so I'm just wondering uh, what, your, what your feeling is on that. I think you're absolutely right. Prevention is a, a, is a key to moving forward. There is a provision, and perhaps this is the one you're referring to in, in the CHIP legislation, that requires education for pregnant women and, and parents of newborns. And we are working on developing an education campaign. We're partnering, we plan on partnering with um, the Centers for Disease Control. We've been reaching out to some of the uh, philanthropic organizations around the country and to look at uh, uh, other mechanisms to, to get information out to, to pregnant women and to newborns about what they can do. We also find that the dental uh, utilization rate is much lower for adolescents, and I think that's also a lack of information about how important dental care is for teenagers. Um, so I think coming up with a campaign that helps to provide some information to parents as well as to teenagers themselves will be really important. Can you uh, soon give us a deadline on that, give us some type of timetable on that since it's such, a, such, a, such an important and potentially beneficial and cost-saving uh, thing. We, we want to we really follow up on that, and uh, I have a tremendous personal interest in that. All right. I would be glad to provide you with a, with a plan and a timetable attached to it. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
I thank the uh, witness for her responsiveness and the GAO for the report. Uh, this committee appreciates your attendance and uh, we'll be in touch with you regarding our next meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, the first panel is uh, dismissed. Uh, we'll now go to the second panel. including its work there. Uh, this is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform. Today's Wednesday, October 7, 2009. Title of today's hearing is Medicaid's efforts to reform since the preventable death of DeMonte Driver. We've heard from uh, witnesses uh, from the uh, GAO and also from the uh, new director for the Center uh, for Medicaid and State Operations. We're fortunate to have an equally outstanding group of witnesses on our second panel. Burton L. Edelstein, uh, who's a uh, DDS and MPH, is a professor of clinical dentistry and clinical health policy and management at Columbia University's College of Dental Medicine and a Mailman School of Public Health. He's founding director and board chair of the Children's Dental Health Project, a DC-based nonprofit policy and strategic consulting organization that advances policies to improve children's oral health. Mary G. McIntyre, uh, MD and MPH, is medical director of the Office of Clinical Standards and uh, quality for the Alabama Medicaid Agency. She received an award from the Alabama Dental Association's House of Delegates in 2004 for uh, outstanding leadership in championing the cause for improved oral health for Alabama's children. Dr. McIntyre served as chairman of the Robert Wood Johnson's Foundation National Advisory Committee State Action for Oral Health Access. Joel Berg, uh, DDS and MS uh, is Professor and Lloyd and K. Chapman Chair of the Lloyd and K. Chapman Chair for Oral Health. He serves as the Chair of the Department of Pediatric Dentistry at the University of Washington and Dental Director at Seattle's Children's Hospital. He's author of a multitude of manuscripts, abstracts, and book chapters regarding a variety of subjects including restorative materials for children, and other work related to biomaterials and is co-editor of a textbook on early childhood oral health. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, or uh, Frank uh, Catalanato, is that right? Uh, uh, DMD is professor and chair of the Department of Community Dentistry and Behavioral Sciences, University of Florida College of Dentistry. He's chaired a number of committees in the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, served on the editorial board of the Academy's journal, Pediatric Dentistry. In addition, he was a member of the National Affairs Committee, the American Association for Dental Research, from, eight, uh, from uh, 
uh, 89 to 95. Uh, this committee works with the federal congressional delegation to increase funding for dental research, particularly for the National Institute of Dental Research. He's currently a member of the Legislative Affairs Committee of the dental, American Dental Education Association, which advises and lobbies on federal policies and appropriations related to dental education and practice. I want to thank all of you for appearing before our subcommittee. It's a policy of our subcommittee on, uh, on uh, domestic policy of the Committee of Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you rise and raise your right hand do you solemnly swear that uh, you will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. As with panel one, I would ask each witness to give an oral summary of his or her testimony. Please keep this summary uh, under five minutes in duration. And your complete statement will be included in the hearing record. Uh, again, thanks to each and every one of the witnesses for being here. I would like Dr. Adelstein to begin uh, as the first witness on this panel. Uh, you may proceed, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today to testify about federal government's role and responsibilities in ensuring that children in Medicaid have access to the dental care that is entitled to them by federal law. I am Dr. Burton Edelstein, Columbia University professor and chair of Children's Dental Health Project here in DC. The founding of the Children's Dental Health Project in 1997 was a direct response to congressional enactment of the state child health insurance program. Because I, as a pediatric dentist who treated children on a daily basis, was shocked by the lack of attention that in 1997 was given to children's oral health. It was not until the death of Diamante Driver that so much attention has been brought to this issue. And the subsequent work by this subcommittee and others has ensured that policymaking, simply as you've demonstrated today, will not leave this issue to fester any longer. The result of the attention that you have brought to this issue led to significant improvements in provisions in CHIP through CHIPRA. I commend the chairman and the committee on this issue, and I cannot think of a better example of how far we have come than to have Cindy Mann as the CMSO director with her personal commitment to children and to children's oral health. Clearly, Mr. Cummings, I, I agree with the statement you made earlier that we may need to do something different, and I think we need to explore the limits of what CMS can and cannot do, as well as what it can do in partnership with other agencies across the federal government. Clearly, all of the progress that has been made has still left a number of challenges. So two and a half years after the subcommittee launched its investigation, we still have Diamante drivers out there. And we need to consider some of the more structural and fundamental issues that limit the access to health care. At the time that CDHP was founded subsequent to SCHIP, the vast majority of advocacy on behalf of oral health for children was made by organizations of dentists. This makes sense, of course, because it's dentists who are on the front line of providing care to children. However, dentists, parents, and the program all both contribute to and can help solve the woeful inadequacy that you've highlighted today. When asked about how to improve the program, dental, dentist organizations typically respond with the very items that we heard featured today. Low payments, complex paperwork, and uh, non-compliant patients. Unfortunately, we have seen in states across the nation that addressing these three issues alone, and many states have taken significant action on these three issues, have not led to the kinds of increases that we would hope for. Research has shown that increasing reimbursement absolutely is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for improving dental access. For example, an analysis done by the California Healthcare Foundation in four states showed that raising reimbursements did significantly kick up the percentage of kids receiving care, but only from a quarter of children to a third, which is that level that we're stagnating at today. Studies currently underway by my research group at Columbia University indicate that during the period 1999 to 2006, 41 states did increase fees. 25 showed no increase in utilization 
primarily because those increases didn't bring them into the market. However, amongst the 25 that did have increase in both fees and utilization, about half, 13, still only reached a level of 33% or more. Overall, in 2006, 20 of our states still provided care to fewer than one-third, and no state has broken the 50% level yet. A variety of factors contribute to this problem, which I've detailed further in my written testimony. Based on the complexity of this issue, CDHP has advocated for a holistic approach to improving children's oral health, an approach that combines both public health and patient-focused interventions. In my written testimony, I lay out solutions that can be pursued by a variety of agencies, by CDC, NIH, HRSA, WIC, Head Start, ARC, as well as CMS. CMS, of course, plays a particularly pivotal role because it's both the funder and the regulator of so much of this care. And the suggestions that we've made fall under the three categories that have been featured already today, leadership, technical assistance, and oversight, which I believe CMS is now fully committed to, to pursue. My colleagues and I at the Children's Dental Health Project look forward to continuing to work with this committee, with CMS, and with all who are concerned about dental care for Medicaid beneficiaries. When CDHP was founded, we called it a project. We specifically called it a project with the realization that the problem we're addressing is solvable. Tooth decay in children is preventable. The irony is that we're putting so much effort into chasing after disease that can be prevented in the first place. I look forward to continuing to work with you and with all who care about children's oral health to solve this problem. That concludes my testimony. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Edelstein. Dr. McIntyre, you may proceed for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Alabama Medicaid Agency and the population that we serve. My name is Dr. Mary McIntyre, and I serve as medical director. I'm not a dentist, but a physician, board certified in public health and general preventive medicine. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today on the progress that we have made. This has been a 10 plus year journey, and it isn't over yet. The vision statement for our state oral health coalition and for our SMILE Alabama initiative is to ensure every child in Alabama enjoys optimal health by providing equal and timely access to quality, comprehensive oral health care where prevention is emphasized, promoting the total well being of the child. I have been asked to address the programmatic aspects of the SMILE Alabama initiative that have, number one, improved access to and the utilization of pediatric dental services, and number two, increased provider enrollment and participation. More than 10 years ago, the Alabama Medicaid Agency recognized that significant growth in the number of children eligible for Medicaid dental services and decrease in dental provider participation in the Medicaid dental program had combined to create a dental access crisis. The dental utilization rate in 1998 was approximately 25%, due largely to the low number of Medicaid participating providers, but also because of the widespread belief that preventive dental care for children especially very young children, was unimportant. Providers complain of low reimbursement rates, uncooperative patients and families, and a cumbersome claims filing process. A decade later, Alabama Medicaid's dental utilization is up by more than 62%, and there has been a 216% increase in the number of dentists who see more than 100 patients per year. There is greater public awareness that good oral health is essential to overall health. What made this possible is the collective determination of many people in both the public and the private sectors to find solutions and the willingness of dental providers, state leaders, and others to implement steps necessary to bring about meaningful change. While the initiative known as SMILE Alabama was the primary catalyst to this important public health achievement, there were several important milestones that laid the groundwork for its success. These include the formation of a dental task force, 
increases in the dental reimbursement rate, major claims process and changes, dental outreach efforts, formation of a public-private alliance, creation of an oral health strategic plan and policy leadership team, convening of two state dental summits, and finally, the successful funding and implementation of the SMILE Alabama initiative. In February of 2001, the Alabama Medicaid Agency received a grant of $250,000 to enhance dental outreach efforts through the SMILE Alabama initiative. Funding for the grant was provided through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's 21st Century Challenge Fund component of the Southern Rural Access Program and was matched by federal, state, and private funds to total more than $1 million. In summary, the SMILE Alabama initiative was composed of four components, a dental reimbursement increase, claims processing simplification, patient outreach and education, and provider outreach. In conclusion, in order to improve access to and the utilization of oral health care services, a focus on prevention and early care is important. A multi-pronged approach must be taken for a complex, multifaceted issue. Efforts must be ongoing. None of us want any child to suffer. I personally know what it is to be a child in severe pain from a dental access because my parents lack the means to obtain care. States are struggling to maintain services in the light of severe budget shortfalls. We are currently experiencing increased enrollment due to the present state of the economy with shrinking budgets while trying to increase utilization. These factors will limit our ability to push utilization up and must be considered in any discussion surrounding finding the solution to the dental access issue. It is important that everyone understand that improving the oral health status of this most vulnerable population will require an understanding of all of the factors that result in underutilization. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today on behalf of the Alabama Medicaid Agency and the recipients that we serve. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre. Dr. Berg, you may proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I thank you for the invitation to testify today. My name is Joel Berg, and I am the chair of the Department of Pediatric Dentistry. I'm a practicing pediatric dentist, and I care for a large number of Medicaid-eligible children. I am honored to appear before you today to represent and share the success of Washington State's Access to Baby and Child Dentistry, or ABCD, program. The goal of ABCD is to expand access to oral health services by Medicaid-eligible children from birth through their sixth birthday. More than a dozen nationally publicized articles and published articles have clearly demonstrated that early prevention reduces future dental costs and that ABCD is an effective, cost-saving method of improving the oral health status of children enrolled in Medicaid. The first ABCD program was established in 1995 in Spokane, Washington, as a collaborative effort between public and private sectors. The community agreed that something needed to be done to address the severe lack of dental access among high-risk, low-income preschool children. ABCD programs are locally administered by a health jurisdiction or a community agency that contracts with the local health department. The administrator then works with an identified ABCD dental champion who is a leading pediatric dentist or general dentist who is selected and trained by the University of Washington to identify, recruit, train, and mentor other local general dentists. ABCD encourages general dental offices, not just pediatric dental offices, to provide a positive dental experience in dental home by age one. The ABCD program is embedded in many local Head Start and early Head Start programs, now both under the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry leadership. In Washington State, ABCD is a collaborative effort of Washington Dental Service Foundation, the University of Washington School of Dentistry, the Department of Social and Health Services, the Washington State Dental Association, the Department of Health, local dental societies, and local health jurisdictions. ABCD certified dentists receive enhanced Medicaid reimbursement for selected procedures on enrolled children. Dental office staff receive training in communication and culturally appropriate follow-up with families and the billing staff learns how to work with the Medicaid program. With the growth of the ABCD program, an increasing number of Washington physicians are now addressing oral health during well child checks because ABCD trained dentists serve as referral sites. 
Medicaid reimburses trained and certified primary care providers for delivering oral screenings, health education, and fluoride varnish applications during well child checks, and they make the necessary referrals to dentists. Today, 31 of Washington's 39 counties, more than 1,000 dentists participate in ABCD, and several other states have expressed interest in adopting this successful program. ABCD has more than doubled the number of young Medicaid children in Washington who are receiving dental care, from 40,000 to 107,000, a utilization increase from 21 to 39 percent. The ABCD program is reducing overall dental costs. Education prevention is most cost-effective during the first two years of life, and ABCD is making progress toward increasing the number of children who receive care before their second birthday. In 2008, nearly 22,000 children under age two, 19% of eligible children received dental services. When the program began in 97, only 3%, close to what is probably the national average today of eligible infants and toddlers received dental care. While targeted enhanced reimbursements for increased frequency of preventive interventions for young Medicaid children are extremely important, other elements must be present to ensure the success of ABCD. The Washington Dental Service Foundation coordinates the program at the state level and provides three-year startup grants to launch the program locally so that outreach to families, case management, support services for the dentists, and other critical activities are included. In the years ahead, the ABCD program will be expanding the use of risk assessment tools as exciting technologies are emerging. This, combined with increasing incentives for earlier intervention and for higher risk children, and expanding partnership to refer the highest risk children, highest risk and low income children, to a dentist as early in life as possible, will further improve the oral health of the program's children. We must combat the growing crisis in childhood dental disease and increase access to care for some of our country's most vulnerable patients. ABCD is a proven best practice that is working in Washington State. I thank you for the opportunity to share this success, and we look forward to working with other states across the country to increase access to dental care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berg. Uh, Dr. Catalanotto, you may proceed. Thank you. Good Mr. afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Jordan and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Frank Catalanotto, and I am Chair of the Department of Community Dentistry and Behavioral Science at the University of Florida College of Dentistry. I'm here today on behalf of the American Dental Education Association, otherwise known as ADEA. ADEA's membership consists of academic dental institutions who serve as dental homes for a broad array of racially and ethnically diverse patients, many of whom are uninsured, underinsured, or reliant on public programs such as Medicaid and the Children's Dental Health Program. The American Dental Education Association is grateful for the opportunity to share our perspectives and recommendations for improving children's dental programs and Medicaid. First, a couple of comments about academic dental institutions as safety net providers, and this to answer some of your questions, Mr. Jordan. Academic dental institutions include dental schools and dental hygiene schools that provide dental care reduced fees and provide millions of dollars of uncompensated care in our clinics each year. All 59 U.S. dental schools and over 200 schools of dental hygiene operate clinics that teach students how to treat a broad array of patients and, con and conditions as part of our educational mission. On average, over 53,000 patient visits were conducted annually at each U.S. dental school, totaling more than 3 million patient visits. And over 50% of those patients were on public assistance programs. At the University of Florida College of Dentistry, we had over 101,000 patient visits in 2008, and 76% of those patients were at 200% of the poverty level or below. A couple of comments about Medicaid dental benefits and, and academic dental institutions. Safety net dental programs in community health centers, local health departments, and academic dental clinics operating at full capacity are only able to meet about 8% of all the unmet dental needs in this country. There are few public subsidies that are available to academic dental institutions to help pay for the uncompensated care we provide. Medicaid dental reimbursement levels have also been historically low. On average, they equal the lowest 10% of market rates in many states. In Florida, for example, our Medicaid reimbursement fees rank at 49th of the states. Therefore, the 74% of the 18,000 children we saw in the University of Florida College of Dental Clinics were at or below poverty level. In other words, they were on Medicaid. 
and the low reimbursement rates we receive put considerable strain on our ability to continue providing these services. I'd like to give you two examples of how academic dental institutions can help improve access to care in the United States. The University of Florida College of Dentistry has a statewide network for community oral health that operates five dental clinics and is affiliated with nine other clinics throughout the state of Florida, from Miami to the border of uh, west, the western part of the state. And these partners include federally qualified community health centers, county health departments, and a mobile dental van. The network serves Florida's most vulnerable populations and provides comprehensive dental care in the areas of greatest need around the state. The second example, in 2002, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the California Endowment funded a program to promote community-based dental education in 23 dental schools with grants totaling approximately $38 million. One of the dental schools funded was the Ohio State University College of Dentistry. The college's goal with the Robert Wood Johnson money was to reach populations in need of dental care across the state. Starting in 2003, when they first received the grant, the dental school had 10 community-based sites. By 2007, they had expanded to 46 sites where their dental students and residents provide dental care to underserved and low-income minority patients. So what are the recommendations we have? My written testimony provides eight specific recommendations that I did would suggest, but I'd like to focus on just three of them. First, fund the expansion of community-based dental education learning programs with academic dental institutions. And the Robert Wood Johnson Pipeline Project is an example of the kind of funding that maybe could be provided at both the federal and at the state level. Second, Develop standards and protocols for models of the care that allow other primary care professionals to help gather data, detect clinically uh, pathological conditions, dental conditions, triage, and refer patients to appropriate dental professionals for care. One of the questions asked earlier was about the role of physicians in providing oral health services. Um, you, you may have noticed in my background that I have a grant from HRSA to actually train physicians to provide such care, to provide oral health preventive services that are fund funded by Medicaid. And involving other members of the healthcare team is a critical step in this process of addressing access to care. And number three, provide federal funds to states for school-based oral health promotion, education and prevention programs, school-based sealant programs and other are an example. In other words, bring care to the K through 12 school system where the children are. In conclusion, the American Dental Education Association believes it is critical for Congress to preserve basic medical services for Medicaid beneficiaries and safeguard essential medical Medicaid dental benefits in any reform of the US healthcare system. ADEA and its member institutions are prepared to work with Congress and other healthcare advocates to identify programs and policies that will increase access to care for underserved patients in Medicaid. That is my testimony. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Doctor. Now, you, you gave us three out of eight. Did you, did you say there were, eight? there were two, sir. Pardon? My apologies. The two of the ones that I wanted to discuss, not okay. three. My error. No, I just wanted to make sure that you feel that you communicated your major points. The, the other uh, six are provided in detail in the written testimony. Okay. Just want to make sure that you uh, had a chance to note that. It sounded like you were on a roll there. I didn't want to. Thank you. Cut you off. Um, let's go to questions to witnesses. Dr. Uh, Edelstein, in your prepared testimony, you addressed the situation that occurred in Georgia, where vendors cut providers from their networks to ward off utilization increases imposed by the states. This is clearly an unintended consequence of a reform that was intended to increase access to care. In your opinion, what does the evidence suggest about the consequences of relying upon Medicaid managed care organizations to provide dental coverage to children? What I'm referencing there is specifically placing managed care companies at financial risk. And as was mentioned earlier, depending on the quality of the contracts and the degree of oversight, it is possible to have a variety of relationships between a state and a managed care company and still uh, have a satisfactory outcome. However, in the case of dentistry per se, there's very little that managed care companies can currently do to manage the care in order to effectuate savings. And so the primary technique 
that they have left to rely upon in order to protect their profit line, because these are for-profit, at-risk companies, is to control utilization. Okay. And that means that there's a perverse incentive built into the concept with regard to dentistry because there's very little else that the managed care company can do to protect its bottom line. Thank, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctors uh, Berg and McIntyre, if you could both uh, uh, give a try at answering this one. Uh, patient compliance is often cited as a barrier to improving outcomes in state Medicaid dental programs. Both of your programs have a case management component. And what are some of the specific interventions of case management? Be before you answer that question, uh, Ms. Mann, I just want to uh, note something. First of all, uh, you may be one of the only administration officials who have actually stayed to hear uh, witnesses on the next panel. It's very rare and refreshing. Thank you. Okay, uh, so Ms. Uh, uh, Dr. McIntyre okay. uh, and uh, Dr. Berg, what are some of the specific interventions of case managers in your programs that increase patient compliance? I, I want to start first with the original because we kind of redesigned things with our first look program. But we originally wanted to address the issues that the providers themselves talked about, which was the, the missed appointments. And what the care coordinators provided was a means of actually contacting patients to assist them with getting into the provider's offices. You know, they addressed issues such as um, the care of the other children, which is something that a lot of times people didn't think about, well, what do they do with the other kids when they really have an appointment to see the dentist for maybe one or two of those children? Issues such as um, transportation to the dental office. And sometimes there were issues that didn't have anything to do with the transportation. There were issues concerning, well, I don't know how I'm going to pay rent tomorrow, so I'm not really worried about keeping a dental appointment next week. So that the care coordinators had to get into not just the issues of the dental appointment themselves, but also the other issues that were surrounding the reasons why these patients wouldn't keep appointments. And then one of the things we had to deal with was also to address the dental provider's problem about behavior in the office, and we did that also as part of this program. We're trying to educate them on, you know, taking one child and making sure that you were on time for your appointments. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre. <clears throat> Dr. Berg, would you like to respond? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I think you're pointing out uh, one of the most important aspects of the success of ABCD is the local ABCD coordinator. It's a county-specific or, or local health jurisdiction-specific program, and we found, indeed, that in the smaller local health jurisdictions, it's easier to get access to care through the ABCD program because it's easier in the smaller communities to coordinate efforts. We found actually that we had lower no-show rates in some of the ABCD programs in those jurisdictions than with the non-Medicaid population. We have evidence to show that. So these care coordinators are absolutely critical in the scheme of things to make things work, and we have evidence of that in different counties. Thank you, thank you Dr. Berg. Uh, the uh, GAO study reveals that states overwhelmingly would like additional guidance from CMS so if uh, we could again hear from uh, Dr. McIntyre and Berg, from the state perspective, what specific suggestions do you have for CMS to improve the guidance they provide to state Medicaid systems? Well, as a state that I think that we had a, pr a relatively, um, what I could say, a very good relationship with our regional office when it came down to getting assistance. We didn't have any problems with calling. But specifically when it comes down to um, recommendations, the main thing is to communicate specifically what we can and cannot do from a state standpoint. And I think a lot of times states are under the, I guess, misinformation as far as with misunderstandings about what policies will allow them to do or not do. But we didn't have that, that particular issue because we got clear communication about, well, you know, when it came down to SMA Alabama, no one told us that we couldn't go after outside funding, so we did. We did check and it was okay, so we went after funding in order to do the program. But I think that's something that other states need to know, that you don't have to deal with just the money that you have, you know, within um, the state coffers, that you can look beyond that and identify private public partnerships in order to do some of the programs that you want to do from a state standpoint. 
Thank you, Doctor. If, if uh, Dr. Berg, if you could answer. My time's expired, but I'd please just give a brief answer. Yes, please. Uh, I'll give specific recommendations. The state of Montana just adopted an, an ABCD-like program modeled after Washington State's program. And they actually did what we would like to have done this year, but it wasn't fundable in the current legislature. And that is to incentivize earlier intervention where where we can separate the highest risk children. We know that, as, as was stated earlier, 80% or something of the cost is spent on 25% of the children. And that starts at about 20, at age two and a half or three. And if at age one we can identify who they were and segregate them and have more aggressive intervention for the higher risk children, we can save money. We've actually done an economic modeling of this through our health economists and have shown that it can work. So I would absolutely uh, look right now at earlier intervention, incentivizing earlier intervention, incentivizing higher risk, more aggressive interventions. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair recognize Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank the witnesses too and for your, your commitment to helping uh, these, these uh, children. Um, you know, the goal is, just, as, as uh, Dr. Berg just said, to treat them as early as possible so save on costs in the long term and, and obviously hopefully avoid any type of tragedies like with DeMonte. Um, and I appreciate the work that the universities are doing. It was, that was great to hear that. And I think I got the numbers. Three million, you said? In, in three, three million uh, dental visits across the 59 dental schools. That does not include any year? of the visits that might have occurred at dental hygiene programs. Wow. And you said your university, your, your school, you, you had 100,000 last year. 100,000 visits, 76% uh, of which were patients at 200% of the poverty level or below. 100,000 children? A hundred, uh, no, I'm sorry. 100,000 dental visits. Uh, there were uh, 26,000 children's visits of okay. that 101,000. Well, wow. so we, we appreciate all that. Uh, Dr. Edelson, in your comments, you said three things. Paperwork, low reimbursement rates, and non-compliant patients make it tough for certain providers to do this care. Which of the three is the is the one that, uh, if you had to rank order those those three, which one is the, the one that is the most difficult for, for dentists to, to deal with? The one that is perceived and reported to be the most difficult is the low reimbursement. And the uh, point I, I had hoped to make clear is that sufficient funding is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Would it help? Let me ask you this question. I'm, I'm going to ask some fundamental questions here. Would it, uh, would it help if Dennis would, would be able to, um, for those families who can pay something, would it help if they could say, okay, Medicaid covers this much and uh, would, would uh, you as a family be willing to pay X amount of dollars or, uh, to cover the cost of the care? Would that help? I have no idea except to suggest that it would create uh, significant, as small business people, it would create significant billing hassles and problems trying to deal with uh, the co-payments. As a practitioner who actively participated in both Medicaid and CHIP in Connecticut, uh, where co-pays were allowed for some CHIP patients in Connecticut, mm -hmm. we did confront significant problems with trying to manage that cost-sharing portion. Okay. Um, so again, you, you started, I think you were starting to say that what you hear typically is low reimbursements, the, 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 the single biggest um, reason given for not accepting these patients, but it sounds to me like that's not what you believe. What, what do you believe? Well, the but was that uh, our, our study nearing completion now uh, tried to assess the impact of different levels of fee increase on utilization. And what we discovered were a couple of things. First off, that with fee increases, generally you have uh, the same providers who were already seeing Medicaid patients, seeing many more Medicaid patients, rather than bringing a lot of new providers into the actual provision okay. of care. Now, that's when fees are the primary intervention. As uh, Dr. McIntyre mentioned in Alabama, there was additionally some case management and uh, reductions in uh, paperwork with prior authorizations. So uh, a multi-pronged approach did help. On the other hand, even in Alabama, with all of its tremendous effort, we see that that relative increase was tremendous, but we still hit the same sort of barrier, uh, hitting the top levels that any states have hit in the 40 to 45 percent right. range. And it's tempting to think that that barrier really represents parents' failure to pursue care. But in fact, parents are able to obtain significantly higher levels of medical care, raising the question about whether the doors to the dental offices are truly open. Okay. How, what, what, uh, 
you mentioned non-compliant patients is one thing here. Do you think that's a that's a real problem or not? Let me just. Uh, well, the non-compliance has to do with appointment keeping, and right. I think Dr. McIntyre well explained how complex some of these individuals' lives are. But there's an excellent example that I cite in my written testimony from New York State Tompkins County where a county level care coordinator like what the American Dental Association has suggested as the community uh, dental health coordinator uh, acted as a case manager. And let, me, let me just ask this, yeah, let me just ask this uh, question of all of you and see what you thought. And I, and I brought this, I think, up in the very first round of our first panel. Um, you know, there are all kinds of taxpayer assistance that, medic, that the typical Medicaid-eligible family receives. Um, I, I kind of come from the school of thought that says if you want responsible behavior, you should reward it. And if you, uh, you know, irresponsible behavior should be, there should be some kind of penalty for it. Um, do you think it would make some sense if, in fact, uh, parents aren't complying with the appointments that they have, aren't, aren't doing what needs to be done for their kids relative to dental care, if there was some kind of sanctioning or some kind of penalty in, you know, typical families getting nine or ten different types. They're getting TANF, they're getting housing, they're getting food stamps, they're getting on and on it goes. Some kind of sanctioning process. Do you think that would, would um, be helpful along with what Dr. McIntyre, I think, and Dr. Berg referred to in, in, in uh, previous answer, the, ca the care coordinator and the case, uh, case manager uh, approach as well? Just go down the line. I personally am more of a carrot than a stick person, thinking that uh, as soon as there's clear understanding of what the child's needs are, that there be an effort to engage the family in a positive way. My concern is the child and recognizing the complexity of some of these lives to get to the, whatever benefits the children. Yeah, it seems to me, you, you, I mean, look, uh, I, I know when we did welfare reform in the state of Ohio, I was the guy who did the, the language on the time limits component. <clears throat> And we said, we're going to make sure kids get health care. We're going to make sure kids get, get uh, you know, the food they need. But at some point, if, if an individual is not willing to work and they're an able-bodied adult, they're no longer going to receive cash from the taxpayers. And it was a long period of time. And we gave them job training and everything else. But at some point, if you don't have that deadline, if you don't have, I always say deadlines influence behavior. And if you don't have that out there as, as some kind of, thing that everyone has to think about. We all have to function under that. Everyone in the world has to function under those kind of responsible things and those kind of deadlines. Seems to me there might be an approach um, in there that, that, that can work and, and mm -hmm. still make sure these kids get what they need. Perhaps when dental access is readily available, when those office doors really are open mm -hmm. and parents can have success in pursuing uh, their desire to find treatment for their kids, then perhaps it would be time to think about the stakes. Mr. Chairman, if I could, real quick. If they could give a quick answer. Sure. Thank the Chairman's indulgence. Real quick. Okay. From, out, from the standpoint, I'm like Bert, I look at the carrot versus the stick, and the reality is sanctions will really hurt the children. Um, because what we're looking at is you're sanctioning the parents for behavior that the kids have no control over. And what happens is then they don't get into care. So really, what, what, the only thing I would say is, okay. I would agree with the last part of Dr. Edelstein's statement as well, that uh, when the access problem is solved and there is much more readily available access, then we could look at some pilot projects perhaps to study that think we don't have enough information to know if it's effective or not. Yeah. I'd want to study it on a small scale and see what kind of effectiveness we'd have. Uh, and just to emphasize that, in Florida, for example, only 10 percent of Florida dentists see Medicaid patients. Our numbers are worse than the rest of the other states. We only have 25 percent of our children achieving any kind of dental visit. So until you solve the access problem, it's not, I don't think it's appropriate to talk about um, punishment for the parents, which ultimately punishes the child. We need to fix the access problem first. Thanks, the gentleman. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Cummings. Thank you, McIntyre. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. T tell me, um, what uh, part did, uh, first of all, the folks who you, you all hire, are these a lot of community people? In other words, because you know, I, I, they have the kind of sensitivity you're talking about, I think they first have to understand it, it really reminds me of a uh, healthy, uh, healthy start. Um, and it, in other words, you have people who understand mm -hmm. the complexity of people's lives. They understand that punishment is, I could have I answered that question. Um, that, that's not going to get it. 
um, because then then they then they will drop out of the mm-hmm. system. They will. Um, but so you must it must be you must look at a certain type of worker who has a certain level of sensitivity. We didn't hire anyone. Let me get that straight. Okay. This is remember when I talked about public private partnerships. Mm-hmm. We actually worked with the health department mm-hmm. to get care coordinators in the community. I see. Um, so that many of these people were folks that knew people already, that people were comfortable with. Mm-hmm. They were at the community level. They were on a county level. So that when you're calling to get a child in, that a lot of times these people really know who the children are. So I think in that standpoint, we didn't go out and hire a bunch of people. We worked with the health department to get care coordinators at the county level in order to work to put this program into place. And that's the whole thing about working together with all of the different entities within the state. It's not just a Medicaid issue. Mm -hmm. It's an issue that involves the entire state, and it involves all the people that are there to coming together to try to come up with a solution. Now, Dr. Ellison, we were talking about the whole idea of, uh, you heard, you were here earlier when we talked with the other panel about this whole idea of uh, a campaign to educate parents with regard to the significance of dental care for their children. Uh, Tell us, I mean, how how do you feel about that? Um, I mean, do you think that's very significant? Yeah, the parents, the parents clearly have a critical role, particularly as Dr. Berg mentioned, that the disease onset is very early in life. And so we need to get two parents very early in life, as required now by CHIPRA. Yeah. Uh, but one of the roles for the parents is the day-to-day, moment-to-moment decisions that they make that either predispose their kids to have this problem or predispose their kids to avoid this problem. Mm-hmm. And so the education needs to be about more than dental care, but has to be about managing the risk factors for developing the disease in the first place. You know, I, I visited a, uh, a Kennedy Krieger um, in my uh, district, which, and they, they have this clinic for, de- for severe dental problems for kids. And they showed me some kids who had had phenomenal damage as little kids, I mean, little. I mean, who literally had to go through major surgery as a little kid, like I mean, like three years old, because of things like a bottle uh, with sugar, uh, like juice bottles, and the and the sugar gets to the tube. And a lot of people don't realize how significant those little things are. And I just think that 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 education is so significant. The other thing that I was going to ask you about is these federally qualified health centers. One of the things that I've you know pushed hard for is making sure that they could contract with uh, dentists because a lot of time that's a missing piece and those health centers are, are, are located smack dab in the middle of places where people would not normally be able to get health care. And you might want to comment on that too, uh, Dr. McIntyre. You, uh, well, if I might reflect on the, uh, the value of that contracting, it has so many values. The first is that it allows dental practitioners who are not Medicaid providers to contract with FQHCs to see Medicaid patients and thereby become familiar with the patients as people, as patients, who they can become more comfortable with and discover really face the same kinds of dental issues that others do and can be readily accommodated in their practices. The second is that it expands the capacity of the federally qualified health center. So many of the health centers are limited either by not having dental facilities themselves or having facilities and no dentist uh, because there is a shortage in the FQHC system. Uh, So that allows them to contract with dentists to expand their capacity. Mm -hmm. So on both sides, uh, it benefits the patients, it benefits the dentist, it benefits the uh, health centers, and we anticipate that that experience the dentist will have will lead them more likely to become active Medicaid providers. And, and, and Dr. McIntyre, did you have a comment on that? And thank yes, you. I wanted to comment that in looking at the, the public-private um, partnership, the FQHCs are vital in making sure that we identify all of the resources available. And some of the things that we did was also identify not just the Medicaid dentist per se, but also for uninsured, because a lot of our uninsured go in and off, you know, their own Medicaid, then they have no insurance at all, to make sure that those resources are available for them. But there is a short. When we talk about addressing access issues, one of the things I wanted to um, bring out was this 
overall in our state as of May, we had uh, a shortage of 288 dentists. Now this is not Medicaid dentists, this is a shortage in dentists in the counties. So in addressing the issue, we have to address the workforce in order to, like he was talking about, are the doors really open? Well, the doors are open, but who gets in at the seat is something that you have to consider when you're looking at that because the workforce itself is part of this problem. Thank you. Thank, I thank the uh, general lady. Chair recognizes Mr. Rice. I thank the gentleman. Uh, and thank you, Chairman, for holding this hearing because I, I do believe that it, it is important that we as the committee uh, that looks at waste, fraud and abuse also look at government efficiency and, and that is, I think, a great deal of what we want to work on here today. Before I do my comments, I would like to yield to uh, the gentleman from Ohio for his question. Well, just a, just a quick comment and, and uh, I do have to run to an RC thing. I, I would just I could tell the panel didn't particularly like my uh, suggestion about holding parents more accountable. But I, I would just point out this, you know, we, we heard from the previous panel that the number was one in three kids, 33 percent were getting the treatment, uh, according to the study done in 2008. And since that time, Ms. Mann's answer was it's been improved all the way up to 36 percent now. So obviously what we're doing isn't working. Maybe it makes sense to try, you know, the same old, same old, giving us the big increase of 3 percent, maybe it makes sense to try something different and go the route that I suggested. That's, that's my only point. I know it's worked in other parts of welfare reform. It's worked in the state of Ohio. Um, and so I would uh, just offer that and thank the gentleman for, uh, for yielding me a few seconds. And, and now I'm going to take a slightly different line of questioning. Uh, I guess I've got an MD, a DMD, and two DDSs. So that probably gives me all the possible opinions. When I was growing up uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, right next to, but slightly down the street from the chairman, we still had a great deal of the, if you will, the public health care system. And a lot of the services at that time were delivered through non-private means if they were going to be delivered. I got my shots uh, through the public system and so on. And, and that, that delivery system for the working poor and even up tiptoeing toward the middle class and certainly for what we would call the most indigent among us today uh, was an accepted part of society. It appears to me as though as we have divested ourselves of that and the Medicaid system has, has been about money being delivered uh, often, often not at the same rate, haven't we moved away from at least germane to today if preventive medicine, recognizing that dentistry is a, is, expands to fill the amount of money you have, uh, that if, if you have enough money, and we here on the dais don't have a dental plan, so, uh, or at least it's not standard in our program, if you have enough money, you don't get amalgam. If you have enough money, you don't get false teeth, you get implants. If you have enough money, you go through a series of much more expensive uh, levels of care, and I think you are you're all aware of just how, how phenomenal dentistry can be if you have the dollars for it. But aren't we here today talking fundamentally about uh, the least, trying to find the least efficient, least, most efficient, least expensive, most universal for the poor delivery of evaluation, cleaning, and prevention? And isn't our system somewhat broken? in that if that's what you wanted to provide, would you provide it the way you do today? And this is regardless of 3 percent more money, 6 percent less money. I'd like your comments on that because for this committee, we do try to think in the sense of organization of government. I'll go right down the line. Thank you, Doctor. Interestingly, this problem is not unique to the United States and underserved populations having lack of dental care is a global phenomenon. So if we look at other countries like ours, mm -hmm. Great Britain, uh, New Zealand, Australia, the Netherlands, to see how they've approached this. They do it primarily with the advent of different kinds of providers. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily the, a public delivery system as opposed to a private delivery system, but it's a more readily accessible, more limited in scope uh, provider who is more like the vulnerable population being treated. And there are a number of ideas from the American Dental Hygienists Association, the American Dental Association, uh, new legislation in Minnesota, uh, experiments and, and new programs in Alaska, uh, a variety of approaches that bring dental therapists to the increasing the capacity for the delivery of services. So looking at other countries, that might be one direction of particular value. 
Well, and as you go down the list, well, the reason I said public is that I understand that dental practice and state regulations tend to predetermine certain things, such as a hygienist being able to work on their own or not, uh, an assistant work on their own or not. And I, I use the term public because it's a preemption for the poor, potentially, that would allow us to or to find the most efficient way to provide preventive medicine that might not be universally available in some states. I'm being a Californian now, I'm aware of that. Please, doctor. Well, as a physician, one of the things that I started out with our group when we first formed our task force and our coalition was that the mouth is part of the body and that for some reason we've kind of separated it out and I think a lot of the problems came from that. But we've actually started using our primary care providers, physicians more because dental caries is a disease. And like any disease, if in order to get away from the disease later, we have to prevent it. So if we can start early when children first get their teeth, you know, when they get those first two in the mouth, even before they get their, their teeth, we start educating mothers when they're pregnant about what they need to do. They get brochures and information from the um, care managers about how to take care of the teeth and the babies aren't here. They're more likely to listen before the babies are born. Then when they get here, then doctors who see children to give them their shots is an ideal opportunity to educate, assess, and refer. And that's what we're trying to do to utilize the system. Yeah, and and if, we, if we can narrow the answer just to the organizational one, because I've really, I'm really testing the chairman. And that is part of the organization. Thank you. OK, using the phys physicians to do part of the work, OK? Please. My comment is a summary of what has been stated before, is that dental caries, cavities in kids is in almost entirely preventable. And the earlier you intervene, the more preventable it is. And the other non-dental providers who aren't treated in the surgical aspects of dentistry can assist us in the risk assessment and the prevention. You know, the fluoride varnish is not the cure, but the risk assessment, determining who's at greatest risk and providing more aggressive and more frequent interventions, that is the solution. So I think we need to segregate the surgery and not think about dentistry as surgery. We have dentists who can do surgery. We need some assistance in the earlier intervention for those folks, as mentioned, yes. who do see the children earlier. Right. Thank you, please. The, the other point that I would mention about this is that there is a fundamental problem, though, in the dental public health infrastructure. What I had mentioned in my testimony is that assuming uh, you had at full capacity the existing public health infrastructure, the dental institutions, county health departments, federally qualified community health centers, they can only address about 8 percent of the dental need that's out there. So part of your solution that you need to look at this is improving the dental public health infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Thank Chairman. you. Uh, the Chair recognizes uh, Ms. Watson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to address this particularly to Dr. McIntyre and Dr. Berg. And uh, I think your two states uh, have participated in some promising uh, practices that were posted by uh, CMS. And uh, in a survey that was taken by GAO, there were 37 states uh, who indicated a need for more information and uh, on other states' efforts. And uh, have you then shared that information? Have you been part of it, promising practices uh, that was initiated by uh, CMS? And uh, can that website then be uh, promoted to other states that need this information? Dr. McIntyre. We have actually provided information um, to a number of people, including CMS. Now, yeah. as far as whether it's part of the promising, I know that we have actually um, published articles. We put out information on our website. We mailed out brochures to all 50 states, it's, you know, basically in the past to actually give them the information about what we were doing. So, and we actually put the information where it's accessible and we're willing to share it with anyone. Uh, one of the things that concerns me is that uh, many of the dentists uh, kind of look at the Medicaid uh, beneficiaries and say, I really don't want them. Uh, what's with that attitude? Oh, 
part of what we did as part of our provider our education and outreach was to educate providers um, that it was a two-way street um, and that in order to receive you know the behavior that they were expecting they also needed to be willing to treat people with respect so we came up with a dental rights and responsibility sheet that addressed the provider on what they could expect and what the patient could expect from the provider and for both of them to sign it. Um, and the reason for that is because, you know, and I'm saying this because as a child who grew up with no insurance and no access to health care, mm -hmm. okay, and people a lot of times looking down on people just because of their income levels is something that we have to go beyond. And that is one of the things that we address with the providers that, you know, you, if you expect people to behave a certain way, you have to treat them so that they will behave that way. If you expect bad behavior, you will get bad behavior. So that's part of the education that we did with our dental task force. Dr. Berg? Yeah, I think it is, uh, part of the success of ABCD is training and cultural sensitivity. And uh, that's a big part with the staff, and it's effective. You know, that there are unique needs of this different population. Uh, their circumstances are different, and that's been critical to success. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add that statement. Well, let me give you a pet peeve of mine. I've had a bill uh, for the last eight years to look at dental amalgams. Amalgams are, as you know, silver fillings are 50% mercury. Mercury is number one uh, toxic element. And uh, I've been getting to the dentist. In fact, the minority dentist came in, and they're adamantly opposed to it because they say it's cheaper to put an amalgam filling in. Well, the research shows that when you have mercury in your fillings, it is constantly gases are constantly escaping, particularly with children. And so I find a real problem with the dentist that says to me, it's a matter of cost. And you know, we have now in your states, Medicaid providing dental health care, and then we don't have this kind of uh, patient result. However, when you get the industry saying to you it's a matter of cost, uh, black people don't like to go to the dentist, so this is the cheapest we can give, I think that's a violation of ethics. How do we continue to educate these dentists? Anybody want to take a swipe at that? You're talking about the amalgam question specifically? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think first of all, to remind them that only about 6% of their total cost is uh, materials, including amalgam and other materials. Mm -hmm. And the real cost is how efficient they are at running their practice. And I think there are best practices, and ABCD has an annual meeting where our, our champions come together and talk about how do I run efficiently in my office. And by changing those behaviors in their office, they can do well by doing good and be much more efficient. So I think that's the focus we give. And by the way, I think, uh, I, I think in our state, I wouldn't say there's any differentiation in any population uh, in terms of who gets what restorative procedure. Uh, we don't happen to do many amalgams because there are alternatives today. Uh, some do, but I think we like to educate that it's the efficiency of running the practice where they're going to save the money, not difference in materials are really minuscule compared to uh, the staff costs and other costs in the practice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. We are uh, going to conclude this hearing, but I want to thank all of you for your testimony. Um, as a representative from the state where Diamante Driver died, um, this hearing means a lot. I've often said that Diamante Driver was a little boy who was suffering from an infected tooth, and he died in one of the richest states in one of the richest counties, in one of the richest countries in the world. There's something wrong with that picture. And we can do better. Uh, Dr. McIntyre, I was just thinking as you were talking about this whole idea of uh, people just getting respect. A lot of times, a lot of people don't realize it, but um, 
people feel so often that folks are talking down to them and they don't, so they don't, they, they feel that they're not respected. When we look at healthcare disparities, for example, one of the things that is clear is that there is a, there's a um, divide and some type of misunderstanding between sometimes those people who are trying to s treat and those who need treatment. And so I think it's very important that um, when we look at the Diamante drivers, we, we look at the kinds of things that you all have talked about here today. Um, and, hope, and I was glad that Ms. Mann stuck around to, to hear some of this. Um, she, one of the things that Ms. Mann said was that, not Ms. Mann, but the, uh, our lady, Ms. Eratani said, was that they wanted, these other states wanted no best practices. Duh. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we, they, they, I mean these, this, is not, this is not rocket scientist stuff. This is basic common sense and trying to work things out and treating human beings as human beings. And so I just kind of think that um, I know we made a lot of headway, but I just wanted to take time to thank all of you all for what you are doing every day because you are affecting children. I mean, I mean, they, and, I, and I say it over and over again, children come on this earth with gifts. They bear gifts. Every one of them bear gifts. They're born on the day that they're born to deliver gifts at certain points in their lives. But what happens is that if we don't treat them right and we don't nurture them and nourish them and, and help them develop, they'll never deliver those gifts. And if they're sitting, as I did as a little boy, sitting in elementary school thinking that cavities was a part of life, wasn't a question of, of, of it was like a, a headache. You're supposed to have cavities. And a lot of people are still thinking that today. That's why this whole education thing is so significant, letting people know, and, and, and that whole idea of letting them know that there is a direct relationship between the body and teeth. They don't think it. So I think all of us, I mean, the testimony that you all have provided today is basics. And hopefully um, somebody's listening, somebody will come to you all, because you all seem to know where you're going and you're on the right path, and allow you to help others to, to get it. Now, the question becomes sometimes not whether people get it, but whether they want to get it, whether they have the will to do what's necessary. And that's where uh, uh, we're gonna come, come in. We're going to try to do everything in our power to make sure that our children, that the providers, that the states, and that all others have the kind of information they need so, they can, so that they can touch our children uh, in a positive way and look out for generations yet unborn. Finally, let me say this. This is about generations. This is bigger than us. This is bigger than us. When you were talking, Dr. McIntyre talked, told my aide, I said, you know, that's a great idea to educate mothers before they give birth. Because you know all that excitement that you have when you found, I'd never get, you know, I'm not a woman, so I don't know, but, but folk get real excited about that first birth in particular. And they go and they prepare the room and, and all that kind of good stuff. And then the question becomes, you know, shouldn't prep part of that preparation be making sure that you're prepared for the teeth of that child and that the dental health. And what I was telling my aide was that, you know, the wonderful thing about it is if you, if you then educate the first, the mother when de de delivering the first child, then that sets a pattern for the other children that may come, but it does something else. It then teaches the child, as a child grows up, how to take care of their teeth and then hopefully generations, you have a generational cycles of good teeth, tooth, tooth uh, taking good care of your, te your teeth. That, that's what it's all about. And so um, thank you all very much. This uh, hearing is now adjourned.